When I get into the car, my face is constantly hurting because I'm smiling ear to ear. Like if you pop up on three wheels, it's like being on a roller coaster, even better. I work my ass off. Being able to step into my car, it's just a huge joy. Like I'll put my three-year-old niece in there and just hit the switch once and she's holding onto the steering wheel and just like screaming. It's like that brings that out in grown ass men. So my 63 Impala SS, AKA the T1000, I always wanted to build a lowrider based on the T1000 from the Terminator. Since I was a kid, the 63 taillights always reminded me of the T1000 with like the red eyes and like the fish scale, like the holographic like look of it. I'm super stoked, it's finally finished, had the trunk done, got some great sounds. Just did a basic setup in it, two pumps, uh, Marzacci 11 gearbox to the front, eight batteries, you know, and something good enough to be able to roll around and hit some switches and have some fun. That's what it's all about. Ultimately, I had a lot of fun making that build, but it all built up to my holy grail, which is my 64 Impala SS Black Sabbath. Always wanted to like theme a car out of Black Sabbath, you know, Ozzy Osbourne. It just seems like that colorway, everything about it was just like, just evil and just badass. It's a 327 turbo fire engine, four speed, Really badass, I've never driven a four speed, but I always wanted one in an Impala, so it just kind of all worked out. So the only thing that I've changed on this car is the wheels. So it's a 72 spoke 13s, they're 90s iron casted Dayton's with the skinny spokes and the baby nipples. You got the dog ear knockoffs and the 24 karat gold plated. As a kid, you just see them and you're like, yeah, that's what's up. The D's, the Dayton's, you throw those on there, you hear them in music and they're just classic, the wire wheels. The fact that this thing is OG and it's just so badass, I've been contemplating, man, should I cut it or not? I have the 63 that's got juice in it, but I kind of just have to. Like every single time I'm driving it, it drives so smooth, but I put my hand down there ready to hit some switches and it's just like, ah, I have to do it. But I'm enjoying it for now. You know, every time that I look through it, I find something new. If you know what you're looking for, you can kind of identify that it's a unicorn. You know, this thing is just like rare. You see the kick panels in there. You see, you know, the mileage. You know, there's so many different things that are really cool about it, like that you'll never see. You know, it came with this dealer book. Say you'd go to the dealer and you're going through the whole sales process. They open it up. You could see the car. You pick the Impala. You go to like the fabric and they like, you know, what do you want? The aqua blue and kind of like throws you back in time because it puts you through the process of like what somebody went when they bought the car in 64. So I grew up in Reno, Nevada. It's a beautiful place. You're close to the rivers, to Lake Tahoe and all those things, but it's also a place that's really small. It's a place where you got to grow up really quickly. You know, you're exposed to all sorts of stuff. I mean, you walk into a 7-Eleven, you know, I'm used to seeing like slot machines and people chain smoking as soon as you walk in trying to get a Slurpee. I come from a family that had very limited resources. You know, we didn't have a lot of money and, you know, getting school supplies and even school clothes was a completely different experience for me. You know, I remember going to like Salvation Army or wherever it was with like a bag and be like, okay, go get your school clothes. My family's from Guatemala, my dad's from Mexico, you know, my grandparents are French Guatemalan, so we got a really cool mix. But, you know, growing up here, you know, my mom didn't know English. Like, I taught my mom how to speak English when I was a little kid. Like, while I was still in grade school learning, I was like, in the welfare line with my mom, like translating for her, like, oh, what are they saying? I'm like, oh, we can only get this much bags of food per household because of this, like, and she'd say, how do you say this? Um, that's something that I think, like, as like a young age, like being there for my mom, like, there was always a sense of like responsibility from day one, like, and I just always knew that, like, I had to be there to help my mom. That's one of my most proudest things is to, I, I taught my mom how to speak English as like a, like a child, <laughs> you know, so I'm proud of that. You know, having limited resources and not having some of those things available to us as a minority family, you know, Latino family, it just naturally builds this drive in you that you just want better for yourself. My mom has been a huge part of my success, my motivation. I mean, it's just being able to support our dreams and to be there to like kick our butt too, you know, it was something that, you know, she played both roles for our whole lives, basically. And something that was really important for me is to have her support. You know, she was there for everything, for the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. I owe everything to my family and the people around me.
For me, when I was 12 years old, I was like skating, jumping fences, drinking 40s, you know, smoking blunts, like hanging out at the swap meet, going to the bands where we're like, hey, what can we get? Like pocket knives and things like that. We're just, that's, kids are like that. Or maybe that's just what it's like growing up in Reno. We were just around things like just drugs and drinking and partying at a super young age, you know? And I think a big part of what made me react and some of my friends were like, how do we escape from this? You know, I think like being around such negativity really just like, just drove like a natural recipe for destruction. And for me, just being able to get out of that was all I wanted. And I didn't even know that, you know? Like I didn't realize that as a young age, I was self-destructing. I don't think any 12-year-old kid should deal with that. In Reno, Nevada, where I grew up, one of the biggest things that anybody that grows up there is going to hot August nights. I mean, I remember seeing the ads like on the freeway that's like, win this 57 Chevy Bel Air, or win this like Impala. And that's when I really fell in love with the cars because it's a town where everybody has a classic car in their garage. Whether it's working or not, you see them and you're just like, you're stoked on them. Kids, the biggest thing that we had was our imagination. When we saw cars at the car show, that was free. That was something that we can go enjoy as a family and not have to spend money. You know, like we can just visually look at that and be inspired by it and, you know, it was really badass. Something that was cool is when I started investigating the car, inspecting it, I mean, I looked at the license plates, like 1998 Reno Gazette Journal, Hot August Nights, I'm like, Dude, this car was meant for me. Like, I swear it was just waiting for me in this garage. And I just knew I had to have it. Somewhere where we always looked up to was Los Angeles. The culture just spoke to us. The low riding scene or the skateboarding scene, like you'd see the skate videos and you're like, oh, I wanna go to, you know, that spot in LA and hit that rail or do this trick there. And you know, you just, just amused by it and you were just impressed by it and you just wanted to live that life. Wanting to get to LA to skate the spots, to see the cars, to see the underground shows, like that was the dream. And since then, like I've always just pushed myself to get out of there. And I think so many things that had happened to me at a young age that like, it was just, I'm happy it happened then because I went through my trials and tribulations as a young child, whether it was through violence or through just, you know, getting in trouble with a lot of young ages in and out of doing, doing these things that were just self-destructive, you know? And I realized like, I gotta get out of here. And I ended up moving. I felt like it was a, uh, like a breath uh, of fresh air, you know? Cause I was like, nobody knows me here. And from there, I kind of just really just wanted to focus on positivity, trying to focus on making an honest living, whatever that was, you know, find somewhere to make money to continue to help my family and to help myself, like, do something that I wanted to do in a business. When I was looking at that diary today, it was kind of crazy because it's the year, it was 2008, and I'm looking at it and I'm reading it and I could see the frustration even in my handwriting. Like it looks like I'm just, the pen is just grinding to the paper. Like you gotta change Josh and the only way to do this, you know, I said this to myself, I wrote it down. I said, the only way that I'm gonna be happy is if I start a business and I work for myself, you know, along those lines is I knew it. I had to, I was driven to just such like pain that I had to write it down. And I started looking through the pages and I'm just like, wow, like just seeing all this, like these, these different parts of my life that just, I knew that I had to move away from. I didn't even have a car, but I would always be looking and like the little classifieds, like what classic cars are in there? You know, like that's like, I didn't even want a real car. You know, I wanted a low rider or like a Carmen Ghia or I wanted a Bel Air, you know? And that was something that I always wanted to like push to get. And how was I gonna do that? And the only way to do that is to just work hard and, you know, in my mind, create a business, something that I could control. I could control my own destiny and manifest that. All my friends were getting a lot better at skating than I was, and I just wanted to document it. And I had always had cameras in my hand. I wanted to film them and just see those hammers go down. You know, like when they landed a trick, I felt like I landed it but I wanted to make full length films. And what was cool about that is it really kind of drove me to, to make that final move to LA. So I was just filming all these local kids, but like they were so talented and they inspired me. And you know, luckily I had met a really great friend of mine today. You know, we're family now, his name's Tosh Townen. He's an old school skateboarder from back in the day. And I met him at Dew Tour. And him and I were just chatting up. He's like, you gotta come to, to Orange County and come skate. He's like, you could stay with me. I had sold my Jeep to my little brother just to cover my plane ticket to get to California. 
So fast forward, I'm living with Tosh Townen on his couch. You know, he just had a baby. His wife's like, who's this dude that's living with us now? All these things happen so fast. I had met a really great friend of mine, Mike Sinclair. You know, he was running the toy, toy machine team in Tumieto. Had met you and Bowman at Thrasher. And long story short, like, we just kind of all got along and they gave me an opportunity to go on King of the Road in like 2012. And like, that's the holy grail as a skateboarder, whether you're filming it or you're skateboarding in it. It's like the Super Bowl. Like, you go on King of the Road, you've achieved all. And I was just so happy to go on it. It changed my life because after that, you know, I just realized that I wanted to get more into different types of technology and media. I was so inspired by that. I started filming commercials and things like this. So naturally, we're gonna get into like new technology, like virtual reality. So when we were doing a lot of really, you know, innovative VR work, we did something with uh, CBS uh, graffiti artist, turned fine artist, Greg Crayola Simpkins. And six months after we had done this really cool piece together, he reached out to us. He's like, hey, like I have a five-year-old niece. She was doing a back bend in her living room. She had a spinal stroke and became paralyzed from the belly button down. Is there anything you could do for her? And Jess and I just quickly went into, we've been exploring this vertical for some time and we don't know, but we'd love to learn about it and see what we can do. So we flew out to Kentucky and stayed there for about 30 days, learning about her paralysis. How can we help her? And the pull away from that was we were doing an assisted crawling exercise where she has to pull and it's painful for her. She cries and doesn't like doing it. I mean, what five-year-old wants to do two hours of PT before school every day? And we had put our headset on her and it was nothing medical. It was actually a VR experience that we shot of Christian Hasoy skateboarding in a swimming pool. And she just instantly like tried to take his board away and she was smiling and we're like, cool, she's not throwing up, she's not dizzy, that's awesome. They pulled us to the side and said, here's the real analytical result of what just happened. Her perception of pain was almost completely diminished. She was willing to exert herself for a longer period of time with more intensity. And her overall like mental state and like engagement was just through the roof. So we're like, holy cow. We wanted to create experiences to help her through her rehabilitation and just quickly realized that it was so much bigger than her and bigger than us. And that's how we started Miron VR. And we create technology that helps spinal cord injury patients through recovery. And for me to do something that is my business, that is my everyday thing now, and you're helping people around the world, like, I mean, I couldn't ask for anything more. Like it's changed my life and we're gonna continue to commit to create better technology to keep it going. Once you've hit rock bottom, like there's only, it's only up. My whole life, whether it was the things that I went through that were just negative, at the end of the day, they're all positive because the silver lining is you're gonna learn something from that. And I think something that I would tell the younger self or anybody growing up is like, believe in your dreams and whether something really bad happens to you, just try to find the positivity in it. I know it's hard, but what can you learn from that mistake or from that incident? Against all odds, I've been able to elevate myself to a place in my life where I can help other people, where I can help my family, from my skate family to my low rider family to my music family to the people in the tech world. My name is Josh Dubon. I'm a tech entrepreneur and I'm a lowrider role model. <laughs>